Hi everyone, my name is Joe Barnard and welcome back to Landing Model Rockets. This is episode 3 and in today's episode we're going to start the design for our flight computer that's going to guide our rocket to propulsively land on the ground. Before we get started, hey Alexa, how do I design a rocket computer? Sorry, I'm not sure. She's not sure and neither am I, so let's get started. Alright, so one of the main goals with the Landing Model Rockets video series is that people with any skill level should be able to follow along. If you have very little experience with electronics or coding, don't worry about that. For this reason, we're actually going to be building two flight computers for these rockets. One will be called Blip, and one will be called Blop. Blip will be a super easy to assemble board for almost anyone. It'll use those little breakout style boards and through hole components so that you only need basic soldering experience. The blip board will end up looking a lot like the old Relay or Zener computers from BPS. Blop is a low mass, low size, and low cost version of blip. Blop will be a single PCB and it will look a lot closer to the current signal boards that BPS makes. Both of these computers will run identical software. They will function exactly the same. Any code that we write for blip will work on blop, and any code that we write for blop will work on blip. So with all that covered, let's think about some of the basic capabilities these computers need to have. First, they need to know the rocket's orientation, that is, which way is this rocket pointed in the air, in the X, Y, and Z axis. They need to be able to understand how high the rocket is above the ground, so they need to know the rocket's altitude. They also need to be able to trigger in-flight events. These are things like um, deploying the parachutes or deploying the landing legs, firing the retro motor, that type of thing. They need to be able to control two thrust vectoring servos, that is for pitch and yaw on the rocket, so that's what's going to gimbal our motor at the bottom. They need to be able to log a bunch of flight data, so we need to be able to um, analyze our performance, the rocket's performance after the flight, so we need to log the data, and we also need to get that data off of the flight computer somehow. This could be transfer via USB, it could be an SD card, who knows. And finally, they need to be able to beep and light up, because here's the thing, if you have a computer and it doesn't beep and light up, is it really a computer at all? No, it has to beep and light up. That is crucial. Okay, so moving on, how are we going to accomplish these things? What are we going to use to accomplish these tasks? So for orientation sensing on the rocket, that is, which way is the rocket pointed, we're going to use something called an IMU, or an Inertial Measurement Unit. Now an IMU usually contains a couple different types of sensors, and in our case there will be two, a gyroscope and an accelerometer. And more accurately, there will be three gyroscopes and three accelerometers for six sensors total. So the three gyroscopes are one on each axis, same for the accelerometer. The gyroscope senses angular rate, um, so that is how fast is an object changing its rotation. And then uh, the accelerometer measures, predictably, acceleration too. There are some IMUs that actually have some motion processing code on board, so you can turn these angular rates and these acceleration measurements into a direct orientation on the rocket. Now that would simplify a whole lot of things for us. And these IMUs actually work very well. They have very advanced filtering on board um, to give us these direct orientation measurements. And they work really well in everything, except rockets. They do not work well in rockets. Now, if you can figure out why they don't work well in rockets, super bonus points for you. Leave it in the comments down below if you can figure out why these things don't work well in rockets when they fuse all of the data together to get an orientation measurement. Here's a quick hint. They use the gyroscope and the accelerometer to figure it out. Okay, I won't say any more. We're gonna cover it in a later video, but see if you can figure it out in the comments down below. Okay. Now, what's next? We need to sense our altitude, so we're going to use a barometric pressure sensor for that. So a barometric pressure sensor measures the atmospheric density of the air surrounding it. And how this works is the atmospheric density gets lower and lower as you get higher and higher up into the atmosphere. This is the reason that you see the rocket's exhaust plume on a Falcon 9 or an Atlas V expand as it goes further up into the atmosphere. So by measuring the change in atmospheric density, even if it's very small, we can use these measurements to determine how high the rocket is above the ground. But, like I said, it's a very small change, so these sensors are kind of noisy, right? Sometimes these sensors give spikes of maybe a half meter off or something like that, even though the rocket doesn't move in that direction. So how are we going to get rid of this noise? Well, we could add some more sensors. We could look at something like uh, a radar altimeter, an ultrasonic rangefinder. We could try to use LIDAR. 
Um, but these things are kind of complicated solutions. And going back to one of the goals of this series is how simple can we make this computer so that just about anyone could build along with this series. We're going to stick with an altimeter, and instead we're going to fix this noise problem in software. What we're going to be doing is using some common or Bayesian filtering with the acceleration data on the rocket to uh, try to augment uh, the barometric pressure sensor data. This is really complicated. We're going to get a lot more into it later. But basically, we should be able to cancel out a lot of the noise that you usually get on a barometric pressure sensor. Now, for these in-flight events, we need to be able to switch a high amount of power, usually in the form of current, to different parts of the rocket. So we need a couple of different channels to do this. And if you've ever switched high amounts of power before, you might think of something like a relay. This is a mechanical switch that can be triggered by a low voltage and low current to switch, I mean, really mechanically, a high load, a high voltage and high current. Now, there are two problems with relays. One is that they're kind of bulky sometimes, um, and two is that they are actually susceptible to mechanical shock, shock or vibration. And this is a big problem because if our rocket hits the ground really hard, we risk um, firing the retromotor accidentally or you know, firing something else accidentally. So we don't want this mechanical solution. We want a digital one or a solid state solution. And that's going to come in the form of something called a MOSFET. Now a MOSFET is a type of transistor that can also switch a high load, but it's all digital. It's not mechanical at all. So we're going to be using four of those on our computer to trigger all sorts of different things. Like I mentioned, we could control parachutes, we could control uh, landing leg deployments or firing the retromotor, all of this stuff. So we'll have four of these channels all controlled by MOSFETs. I mentioned servo control is one of the capabilities these computers need as well, and to do that, all we need is two pins on the processor that can control a PWM type signal. This is a pulse with modulation uh, type signal. This is pretty simple, um, and it's just going to allow our processor to talk to the servos to tell them which direction to point. Now, speaking of processors, we're actually going to be using uh, a really widely available Atmega328 processor. Um, this is the same thing that's on the Arduino Uno and the same thing that's on the Arduino Nano. Um, and this is basically just going to control all of the things on the computer. The processor is going to talk to all the sensors, it's going to do all the math on board, and it's really where the heart of the computer is. The 328 has slightly low memory and runs at a slightly low speed, but here's the thing. The Saturn V flight computer ran at, roughly speaking, about 2 megahertz, and the 328 runs at 16, so I'm sure we'll be fine. The other thing, too, is it's just kind of a fun challenge to see how much code and software you can fit on a tiny little processor to get it to work. Okay, next up, like I mentioned before, we need to be able to log a bunch of data on the flight computer so that we can view it after the flight and see how our rocket performed. So to do this, we're going to use a little SPI flash chip. You might think right off the bat, well, why aren't you using something like an SD card or a micro SD card? And the problem with that is it's a mechanical connection to the flight computer. These two are not directly soldered together, and because rockets have very high vibration and very high shock, um, there's a risk of breaking that mechanical connection in flight, and so by that we risk corrupting a bunch of our flight files. So what will end up happening is while the rocket is in flight, it will be pushing all of this data onto this little non-volatile flash chip, and then once the rocket lands, and we can confirm that it's on the ground and going to stay still for a while, we can take all of this data and move it to the SD card so it's really easily accessible after the flight. This whole setup has the added advantage that we have a virtually infinite amount of storage on our card to store, you know, a bunch of flight data. I mean, you can get SD cards now that are like a terabyte, so this is a really big advantage. Um, the only thing that I'm slightly concerned about is that some of the Arduino SD libraries are a little bit bulky. So, in the case that we can't get the SD card code to fit into the flight software, it's a non-critical component. We can actually transfer the flight data via USB if the SD card doesn't work. But I'm going to try this route first. If it doesn't work, we have a solid backup plan. And finally, for the most crucial component, our computer needs to beep and light up. And for that, we'll use a little LED and a buzzer. So, we know what our computer needs to do. We know, generally speaking, how we're going to do it. So now it's time to pick out our parts. There are a tremendous number of parts that we can select from online, and so to help narrow down our selection process, we're going to use a set of constraints. I have four major ones here. So number one, I'd like these parts to be reasonably priced. Again, going back to the goal of this video series, I'd like just about anyone to be able to build this stuff along with me. Number two, the components need to be available in a breakout version and a standalone version. And what this means is for Blip, this is the computer that's easier to build and easier to solder. The components need to be available in a breakout style board. And then for Blop, we want them available as standalone versions so we can 
solder them directly to the PCB. Number three, each component should come with either a strong datasheet and or a reputable library. Now the datasheet is a big document that the part manufacturer will make that describes almost everything about how the part will work and how you can use it in an application. And a library is like a big chunk of code that you can put into your software that both literally and figuratively helps you get off the ground faster. We don't technically need either of these, but it's another one of those things that's gonna really help us get started a lot faster. So we're gonna set it as a constraint. And number four, these parts must be widely available and used by others. This might seem strange at first, but here's the reasoning behind it. If we end up running into problems or trouble with a specific sensor or component and we have some questions, we wanna be able to turn to a wide user base to help us. It's a lot easier to Google a question and find it on some forum post or something like that than it is to sift through a really dry and massive data sheet. Having a strong user base also means that we can probably rely on the part being available for a longer period of time. Sensors and components, they go on and offline all the time, they go in and out of production. So the part manufacturer will have serious incentive to continue producing that part if a lot of people already use it. So I like to design around existing components that are widely used. And so at this point, you've got the requirements for the flight computer's capability, we have a general idea of what components we're gonna use, and we've set some basic constraints. So now it is time to pick out some parts. Searching for the right components or parts can take some serious time, and unfortunately there's no straightforward process. I'll usually start by Googling a few keywords about what the component is or what I want it to do, and then I'll see if I can find components that others have found success with. Because this process can take anywhere from like a couple hours up to a couple of days, we're not gonna do that in this video. I have already picked out the components for Blip and Blop, and we'll go through them now, starting with the processor. As mentioned before, the processor is really the heart of the computer. It's going to be talking to all of the different sensors and components on the boards during flight, and it's really the component that decides how well the rocket flies. So again, as mentioned before, the processor is an Atmega 328. It's the same one used in the Arduino Uno, the Arduino Nano, and a bunch of other DIY projects, so we're going to have a great base of users to work with if you run into trouble. The 328 should have just enough processing power and storage space to accomplish the task at hand, and it should also have enough GPIO pins. This stands for General Purpose Input and Output Pins. These are the digital pins that go to each of the individual parts of the board to help us control the individual sensors and events. For Blip, we're going to be using the Arduino Nano just mounted onto the board, and for Blop, we're going to be mounting that processor directly onto the PCB. For the IMU, or Inertial Measurement Unit, on our computer, we're going to be using the InventSense MPU6050. This is a low-cost, widely used, and well-supported sensor, especially in the hobby community. It comes in several different flavors of breakout boards, too, sometimes labeled as the GY521. This sensor also has some of that sensor fusion, or absolute orientation stuff that we talked about earlier, but we don't need those direct orientation outputs. We just need the raw values from the gyroscopes and accelerometers, so this is going to be a great fit. For the barometric pressure sensor, we're going to be using the Bosch BMP280. This is another low-cost, widely used, and well-supported sensor that comes in several different flavors of breakout boards. Just like the IMU in the processor, the BMP280 will be mounted to the breakout board, which is then mounted to the main PCB on Blip, and for Blop, it will be mounted directly onto the PCB. For the MOSFETs, we're going to be using N-channel transistors. There are a ton of options for part selection and availability here and different options for what we can use, but what we're really looking for is a transistor that can handle a lot of current and that can be switched on between 1 and 3 volts. For data logging, we're going to use that little SPI flash chip that I mentioned before, and this is the only one that doesn't have a great breakout solution. There are a couple options available for breakout boards for this chip, but none of them are manufactured by more mainstream companies like Adafruit or SparkFun or something like that, so I don't want to base designs on these more obscure breakout boards in case they're not available in a few months. That said, the good news is this chip is widely available, and it's used in applications like automotive engineering or uh, industrial design, things like that. So we will be using this chip, and it's actually one of the easiest surface mount components that you can solder, so very little experience should be required. In order to get data off the board, we're going to use a standard micro SD card slot. Now, as mentioned before, some of the Arduino SD libraries take up a little bit too much program space, or a little bit more than I really want. So if we can't make this work, we can still just ditch the SD card and dump the data via the USB cable directly to a desktop or laptop computer. So we're going to try to use the SD card, but if we can't, it can still be fine. For state indication, we're going to use a tricolor LED and a buzzer. Now, before we get done here, each computer is also going to need some resistors, capacitors, passive components, and voltage regulator. 
Now for blip, it's just gonna be a couple of resistors and capacitors. These are gonna be really easy to solder on through whole components. And these are gonna be for power regulation and some of the MOSFET circuitry. But for BLOP, we're going to need to solder on a lot more components because we're gonna be replicating all of that breakout board surgery <laughs> circuitry on the main PCB, no surgery involved. Okay, so we know what the flight computers need to do. We know how they're going to do it. We know the components that they're going to use. And so the next step here is to get to work designing the PCB or printed circuit board for these. Now, there are a lot of programs that you can use to design printed circuit boards, and they all have their advantages. I'm using Eagle today because it's very widely used and it's well supported, just like a lot of the components that we chose. But here's a little secret. Every now and then, someone will send me an email asking about what the best PCB design program is, or maybe it's the best CAD software, and the answer is always the same. Let me read you a list really quick. PCB, FreePCB, Eagle, KiCad, Altium Designer, OrCad, EasyEDA, Circuit Maker, Fritzing, all of these are PCB design programs, and they all do the same thing, they just do it differently. There is no best program. The best tool is the one that you know well. So I'm using Eagle because I just know it well. There are lots of options here and none of them are really wrong. Sometimes people seem to get really worked up over what the best program is, and oftentimes there's no right answer. The best advice I can give is pick a program that seems well supported and sink your teeth in. I'll end my little rant here, but in the next episode of Landing Model Rockets, we're going to be designing the schematic for these flight computers. As these videos come out, the files that we design will be available through Patreon, which is linked down below. The idea here is, again, that if you wanted to build these along with me, you could do so pretty easily. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. My name is Joe Barnard, may your skies be blue, and your winds be low.